United States. She will be speaking on the concept of happiness in mysticism. Mysticism. Well, we have listened to her talks earlier. Very interesting ones. Very original, thought provoking. Today too, we all hope that her lecture would arouse interesting questions in our minds, which we can take on for discussion after the lecture. Well, Dr. Leila is a dual PhD uh, uh, and she has a specialization in Islamic philosophy and Shia intellectual history. So, I don't uh, wish to uh, describe her in detail because that will kill a lot of time. We are more interested in her lecture. So, welcome. Uh, I welcome you, madam, to this platform of philosophy family. We are very much eager to listen to your lecture. I also welcome senior professors, Professor Avinas Srivastav, sir, Professor Dr. Ranjit Ghosh, sir, and others, and other regular participants in philosophy family webinars. So with these words, I also welcome our admin and host and all participants to this Sunday webinar of philosophy family. And I hope like the earlier ones, we will be having a very nice talk by Dr. Leila and also interesting questions by Professor Srivastava and Dr. Ghosh, which will be taken for discussion after the talk. So with these words, I welcome one and all. And also, uh, uh, we all uh, now uh, let us move to uh, Dr. Leila for her talk. Welcome, madam. Namaskar and welcome, madam. Dr. Leila. She is not in line. Oh, she is not there. Okay. She is not some, present. Some, some, uh, some connectivity issue. Well, uh, just wait for a while. Good. We speak something. Good evening, sir. Ah, yes, speak there. Welcome. Uh, okay, uh, we see uh, uh, Professor Amidullah. Yeah, I'm there. Point. Well, uh, he is an expert uh, in Islamic studies, and uh, well, she has joined. Yeah, thank you. some issues. So, uh, Leila ji has not joined so far. Yes, she has joined back from network issue probably. Okay. Well, we should wait for some time uh, yeah, yeah. so that she can join. Okay. Srinivasan ji, you speak something about happiness till she joins. Srinivasan ji is not there, sir. Sorry, sorry, sir. Sorry, Sir. 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 Participants assembled here, the learned participants. In fact, I am not to, to speak because I don't have any specialization. But since happiness is such a thing that each and every individual want, we want two things. One is peace, another is happiness. And that's why the happiness creates the core of the Indian philosophy and Western as well, because everyone, everyone want peace. They do not want to be at anything except the peace 
and happiness. Now question arises, how can we have the happiness because the entire universe, if we have a glance over the today's panoramic, if, if, if we have a panoramic view of the today's world, we find that no one is at happiness because everyone is running after happiness and peace. And Iqbal has rightly observed, Farebe nazar hai sakune hayat, talapta hai har zarrae kayanat, samasta hai tu raza hai zindagi, fakat zoke parwaza hai zindagi. Hum ne dekhe hai pasto baland, safar isko manzil se balkar pasand. And when man is running after the happiness, I don't think that in this world the happiness will be found because it is lost in everything. Agar hangama hai, shok se tha lam ka khali. But I cannot accuse for this or for ourselves. Agar hangama hai, shok se hai lam ka khali. Khata kiski hai ya rab, lam ka tera hai ya mera. This is the brute reality that we all are running for happiness. We are running, we are chasing the happiness. But it's in run, running from pillar to post, we are not at peace and we are not at happiness. But one thing is very sure, that happiness is, and everyone won't eat. And that's why it is said in our ancient realism, Ananda Dev Khalvimani Bhutani Jayante, for this happiness, for this peace, this entire universe is created. And it is nothing but the dance of the Shiva, full of ananda, full of joy, that has converted the entire universe, a beautiful one. And it is me, it is us who are creating the problems everywhere in search of peace and happiness. Now question arises, how this happiness can be had? And this is the basic problem that everyone wants to have it because very recently I have found our learned speaker was here and after some time she was disconnected whatever the reason is but we are searching her for the lecture of the peace and happiness and this is the reason that in our everyday life we search peace and where we stop thinking of, about the happiness and to gather it, there the peace starts. And that's why it is said, where expectation ends, the peace starts. And for that, you will have to peek into the Gita. Gita says very categorically, because what happens with Arjuna, he was very tormented because he, he has lost the entire content, he want to regain it, but what, when he found the kids and kings opposite to him to fight, he was bewildered what to do and what not to do. How he will derive ananda from that, how he will derive peace from that, how will he derive, I think Laila Ji has already arrived, I should stop my talk and in honor, and I will like to uh, listen to her, not to her. And that's why finally I conclude because everyone happiness and that's why for that you will have to regain the rhythm in the life and the rhythm in the life will be calculated in this program by the speech of our Nanaji. Namaskar. Thank you very much. I was a filler in your absence here. Hello, everybody. Thank you to the organizers. Sure. Sorry about that. I thought <laughs> you. Uh, Your voice is breaking, madam. Your voice is breaking. No, it is also disrupted.
She may not use the, she will just uh, not use the uh, uh, video. Only audio will do it. So. so can you hear me now? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, I think the rest, the other microphones must be off. That's why in order not to have this, I mean, disruption. Okay, anyways, so. Uh, the concept of happiness in Islamic in mysticism. The question is how happiness is conceptualized and defined in mysticism. So I define it um, whether Islamic or non-Islamic. I define it in the broadest sense of the term, broadest term possible, because I want to um, I wanted to cover um, other branches of um, mysticism, which is, for instance, um, spirituality in Buddhism, in Stoics, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, so, um, generally, very, very, very generally speaking, we have two schools in Islamic mysticism. One of them is the school of intoxication or soch, and the other one is the school of um, severity or sah. But my concern is the intoxication school. Uh, why? Because happiness is uh, one of the main goals, if not to say the goal of this kind of mysticism. Both of them, however, both of them, both the form of soap and the form of sap or intoxication and severity, they have a um, background in Islamic sacred sources such as Hadith and Quran. But the main argument of the, uh, the Sufis of this kind of mysticism is that um, the, the, the best way possible to be grateful, to be thankful to God and be shakir to Allah and his blessings, etc., etc., is to be happy. So expressing happiness is actually expressing thankfulness and gratefulness. We have big names here. For instance, Hafez, Hafez of Shiraz, Rumi. It's very important in Rumi. We have Ibn Arabi here, Hallaj, um, mainly Sufis of Khorasan. Um, Khorasani Sufis or Khorasani Sufism is um, actually the, the, um, the um, intoxication mysticism with happiness at the center of it. This school is also called the, the, the Sufism, the mysticism or Sufism of love. We have other figures as well who are not necessarily Sufism, Sufis of Khorasan such as Rabia Adviyah. For them, the best way of ha um, thankfulness is to be happy and also to show love to others, no matter the human being, I mean, to other humans, to nature, to your fellow humans, etc., etc. So, um, and that famous sentence, Al Majaz Kantaratul Hakika, means that um, the Majaz means what, whatever is not real. I just forgot a good equivalence for it. Means that the, the, the physical love, the inwardly love, is a bridge, a kantara, is a bridge to act to real love, to the truthful love, which is love of God. So we must show as much love as possible to others and to nature, etc., etc. That is why we see Sama is important in this point of Sufism. Why? Because Sama is, or that, or that, I mean, kind of dance, dancing. Because Sama is the actual manifestation of the love that that you you as a Sufi have within you. If you want to share, then you go to Sama. We know that Sama was very important for physical world, being actual and for, for me and for Ibn Arabi as well. So, on the other hand, on the opposite. We have a uh, mysticism of a uh, severity which they believe that by being um, sad, by being so by showing sorrow, etc., etc., regretfulness, by crying, uh, then you show thankfulness and gratefulness to Allah. This is not my concern here. So, um, why, why this happened? Why happiness has become this is an important question. Why Happiness has become a um, thing not uh, physical and uh, not um, external. The reason, there are many reasons for it, but the main reason is that by the attack of um, Arab troops or Muslims, by the entrance of Islam into Iran, 
um, Iranians just cut off with their um, usual traditional pre-Islamic uh, civil, I mean, culture, not completely, but in a very big way. So the ecosystem, something happened to their um, intellectual life, to their ecosystem that, because that culture, pre-Islamic Iran, just like what you have in India, was based on dance, on dancing, on music, drinking wine was not prohibited. So happiness was um, just in a very normal way. People show their happiness, um, their happy, I mean, mental situation in, in a very normal way, just like others, by drinking, by dancing, by being in Jashan, as you say, in India. But with Islam, a big interruption happened. Islam does not not only does not recommend this, but I mean, seriously prohibit things such as drinking, dancing, particularly when women are, are involved in it. And with the emphasis on zohd, on piety, and um, on taqwa, etc., etc. So happiness has had to had to find a very inward, inwardly uh, face and uh, aspect. That is why happiness became. Um, I mean, became something very spiritual and intellectual. You want to show your happiness, you have, I mean, the, the maximum thing that you can have is Sama. And happiness is something spiritual, which means that this is your goal, but happiness is not related to um, worldly, um, physical stuff in the actual world out, out there. Um, the more um, poor, the more faqir, the more um, the more poor you are, the, the happier you are. The more you are detached yourself from this world, the happier you are. Why? Because um, happiness is defined in a spiritual, intellectual way and not in a physical way that it used to be in pre-Islamic Iran. That's the main point. Mm, and we see that, um, we see many Suf Sufi um, circles or Salsalas or Tariqas or um, I mean, groups, they show up at this time from 3rd century onward. Um, uh, and happiness has re is related to other things such as uh, patience, sabr, contentment or rezayat or tanaat, uh, kindness, charity and being very kind, being nice to your fellow um, humans. So, um, this is the whole thing about um, a fun um, Sufism of uh, intoxication, which was my concern here. On the other hand, we see lots of similarities um, with uh, Stoics in ancient Greece. What does that mean? Who were they? We know, we, we have lots of information about them. Uh, they were citizens of um, Greek uh, police such as Athens, Sparta, mostly Athens mostly Athens. They were the students of, spiritual students of Socrates. Socrates was um, their, I mean, spiritual father. They a very influential and inspiring uh, figure for them. Um, again, happiness was the main goal. But it was defined a, a little bit differently. It means that, um, means that uh, here, um, happiness is the, co is the goal, is the main objective. But um, wisdom is important. Wisdom is the tool, which means that um, in order to be happy, you, you need to be wise. And who is wise? Wise is the person who is, um, who is virtuous, uh, who has moral excellences, who has cultivated lots of um, moral excellences and ethics, etiquettes in him, himself or herself, mostly himself, because women were absent from social life at that time. So. Um, and such a person has freedom. They means that so freedom, wisdom, and uh, freedom, wisdom, um, they were all connected to each other in order to make you happy. Uh, a happy person was a person who was at peace with himself and with um, with nature, with cosmos, and with his fellow citizens of fellow human. It was very important to be at peace with fellow citizens, fellow humans. So, which means that unlike, but here, unlike mysticism that I just explained, um, Stoics were, um, Stoicism had, had a bold social and uh, political 
dimensions. They wanted to be citizens of the cosmos. So uh, here again, I mean, lots of similarities with mysticism that we I just explained. And uh, the, another group, another, I mean, um, school or another religion in which happiness is, is very important, is central, is Buddhism. We have lots of information about Buddhism, particularly you guys in India. You may encounter Buddhists with you, I mean, around you, so you, you have abundance of information about Buddhism. So again, happiness is the goal. We know that the goal of Buddha was to have happiness. Again, detachment from this world. Um, Buddhism and Islam have lots of similarities. They, they have many things in common. Um, with the help of Ignaz Goldziger, that Polish uh, scholar, we know that um, Islam has actually gained, Islamic, particularly Islamic mysticism and even Islamic rituals have gained many things from Buddhism. So um, particularly in this point that you need to detach yourself from world, from worldly attachment, etc., etc., in, in order to be more spiritual and be more happy. So happy, happiness has three levels in Buddhism. The, the lowest level, the lowest level is um, physical or daily or temporal happiness. For instance, we are happy because we have food. We are happy because we have we have shelter. We are happy because we have a good feeling at the moment. We are not happy because we don't have it, etc., etc. This is the lowest level of happiness. The second um, level of happiness, which is a bit higher than that, is uh, well-being and joy and happiness which is more intellectual and spiritual and the third level of happiness which is the highest level of happiness is um, to be totally content or khane or razi with whatever you have to be at peace with your destiny we have the same thing we see the same thing in islamic mysticism and in stoics so it means that you are at the utmost level of happiness or status of happiness when you are content with whatever you have and you are at peace in, at peace with yourself mm, and you have cultivated virtuous qualities. So we see that in these three instances that I just mentioned, mm, happiness is not material, actually is anti-material, which means that the poorer you are, the happier, the happier you are. Uh, and um, in order to be happy means that you need to be at peace with your fellow citizens. We have it in Hafez of Shiraz. It's very important. Hafez has, has many po piece of poets that, poems, sorry, poems that um, you need to be tolerant by Dustan Morabad, by Dushmanan Mudara, for instance. You need to be um, kind to your friends and be tolerant, be tolerant to your, even to your enemies or you are not allowed to do your bad or mischievous stuff or nasty stuff to your, even to your enemies. At that time, at that level, you are at the utmost I mean, status of happiness. Stoics had the same thing. They cultivated happiness. They, they believed that we are the citizens of the cosmos. And since there was no difference between people for them, Mm, they, 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 they just they claim that we are happy. Buddhism teaches the same thing, propagates the same thing, and, um, and that is why, I mean, happiness has connection to self-cultivation, to self, um, to making a better person out of your personality, your nature, or your natural disposition. So I think this is the most important things that I just wanted to say about that is why we see, for instance, Sufis, Sufis or Stoics were happy wherever they were. They were, for instance, they, even they were in prisons, they were happy because they had internal happiness. Stoics were the same, and also Buddhists. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I am I am open to any feedback, to any question, to any comments that you guys have for me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Leila, for your lecture. Well, uh, um, well, uh, I'm not going to synopsize um, uh, Dr. Leila's lectures, but uh, the basic uh, ideas, uh, what I could uh, see from her lecture is that uh, see. Uh, 
saves happiness uh, uh, is a goal and uh, it lies in um, being thankful being grateful and being contented with whatever we have being kind and uh, she says uh, well um, happiness lies in detachment from this world so this line really attracts me when uh, i feel like um, uh, going to uh, uh, look into what she says she means to say that happiness is something that is within us but mistakenly we try to uh, search it outside us and that's the greatest problem that's right so 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 that's right justify this uh, she uh, talks of the three levels of happiness and at the highest level she uh, more or less tries to say that it is something pure and it's something uh, which is within us and uh, there is a uh, uh, peace with everything and that comes only when uh, we see uh, happiness as something uh, already there within us so that is the uh, that is the point we should uh, we should we should we should try to learn and uh, thank you madam for the lecture well uh, we have with us professor srivastava well i could see uh, him um, on the screen well professor uh, srivastava please your comments and your questions please professor srivastava welcome sir sir please unmute sir Sir, please unmute, sir. Professor Srivastava, your microphone is off. No, not audible, sir. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. I'm extremely yes. sorry. Before, let me first congratulate you for a wonderful speech you have delivered I here. I think cannot hear you, or probably because the, yeah, they. Yeah, it 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 was short and very thematic as well. But before your arrival, I was saying the same thing because um, the happiness cannot be found in the external things, and it has to be internalized. And for that, one thing I would like to say, just I have narrated earlier, the entire world, we will have to accept the mighty concept of the God, and if we surrender unto Him, as Gita says, Sarva Dharma Na Parite Jang Mame Kan Sran Barja. in that state you will not be able to be discontented and the same way ikbal says agar kazrau hai anjum asma tera hai ya mera mujhe fakre jahan kyon ho jahan tera hai ya mera agar hangama hai shauk se hai lam ka khali khata kiski hai ya rab lam ka tera hai ya mera if you come in that stage of disinterestedness and everything you send to the god itself what will happen your internal peace will emerge and that's why the sufis who have derived all these things from the upanishads they speak of the love of the god and that is the supreme happiness and i can just quote one or two verses he says ishq mein zindagi ka maza hai yahi iska za karbat badalta rahe ha ye ghadiya sabogam ki palti rahe lift aata rahe dil bahalta rahe he says very importantly that उनको आना है तो इफ इफ खुदा इज इफ गॉड कम्स टू मी एंड वांट टू ब्लेस मी ही सेज उनको आना है तो इस तरह आए वो उनका पर्दा रहे हमको दीदार हो पास चिलमन से यूं आप देखा करें पास चिलमन के यूं आप बैठी रहे बैठे रहे नूर छन छन के बाहर निकलता रहे दिस इज दिस इज द सुप्रीम पोजिशन ऑफ हैप्पीनेस इन द इस्लामिक कंटेंट आई सिंह and if you you have compared it with buddhism i tell you very honestly because i have read a little bit buddhism also buddhism talks of three things sarvam dukham everything entire world is full of pains sarvam anatmam there is soullessness and sarvam chhanikam and in that thing to perceive happiness there and whatever the nirvan the condition of nirvan comes that is neither happiness nor nor happiness because it is the state of the blooming out so happy buddhism cannot be compared with the islamic contents because both are symmetrically opposed to each other islam talks of happiness islam talks of god islam talks of uh, soul but buddhism never talks of soul buddhism does not talk of happiness buddhism does not talk of eternity so all these things are dramatically opposed to it one thing i would like to say in gita and in your speech there's quite parity 
because if we are troubled by the external affairs the modern, if you view the entire thing and as i have already stated earlier to you that iqbal has said agar iqbal has said pare bhi nazar hai sakoon e hayat talapta hai har zarra e kainat only because of our uh, expectations all these things happen and expectations can be curbed then and then only the happiness emerges and it it can be curbed in two ways by wisdom and by surrendering to the god thank you sorry for interruption i am somewhat surprised as to why you believe that buddhism has nothing to do with happiness how is it possible happiness is very important in buddhism and that is why they they go through that spiritual way i mean the whole the whole teachings of buddha i mean revolves around it how do you say that buddhism has nothing to do with happiness i cannot accept this i'm sorry yes you are right and it. It, it talks of loving kindness it talks of loving kindness for others and that's why then mahayan branch has emerged in the buddhism if you go to the theravada buddhism you will not find these things in a minute detail if at all you have to see the loving kindness and the, all these things you will have to tr- shift to the mahayana buddhism that was formed much later after his death after 3 um, 1000 years it emerged in a whole way and recently i had been to vietnam and there we found that they are thinking of happiness and this happiness can be had by avalokiteshwar and sen he says ki so long the man is brooding so long the man is in trouble avalokiteshwar will not leave this world and he will take uh, the sins of all the human beings on himself and provide him the happiness in the life but it is not of early buddhism it is of the latter buddhism thank you very much for your nice speech well <coughs> thanks you <sir. coughs> Well, uh, Dr. Leila, do you want to say something? Well, sir, no, 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 no. Professor Srivastava. Well, one thing uh, well comes to my mind. Well, as you say, that world is full of suffering. Buddha, Buddha says in the noble truth, first noble truth. Well, uh, and Buddha tries, and 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 he gives a way to come out of this suffering. So when he gives a way to come out of this suffering, is it not that uh, path leading to a sort of happiness? Right. it is not the path leading to happiness because the nirvana when it was asked from the uh, nagasena that what is nirvana he didn't say it is a state of bliss he didn't say what buddha says the nirvana is a state where the stream of consciousness blooms out if you have a lamp and the lamp is just burn getting oil from inside and the moment the oil is gone the lamp booms blooms out where does it go it is immaterial and that's why buddha kept mum on all these questions pertaining to sukha atma and uh, happiness he says it is just blooming out you will not have any sensation but later on in mahayana buddhism the concept of loving kindness came because it was the arhat ideal that was individual in its character and the mahayan buddhism has the collective uh, uh, transformation of the human mind it is the co- collective tr- uh, emancipation and that's why here emerges the concept of happiness because he says the moment each and every one is emancipated then my work is done and i will be struggling for that till each and every individual of this universe is liberated and attains happiness and for mundane purpose he says you have loving kindness for others and i tell you one more thing a very new concept he says whenever you eat you say everyone have this buddha food and if you think for each and every individual a loving kindness comes in your mind in in your heart and then and then only the wave of kindness spreads on everywhere but if then and then after 
your worries will be away and the happiness may emerge but it cannot be said for the early buddhism no, but it's still my problem still uh, persists sir when buddha well, in the noble truths uh, he says there can sir. be cessation of suffering and he suggests the eightfold path but still uh, sir, 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 suffering sir, is gone. Let, let me end he talks of suffering he talks of cause of suffering it talks of nirvana and it talks path leading to nirvana but he has defined nirvana not in the terms of happiness but in the terms of blooming out of the stream of consciousness so happiness the concept of happiness has found its gen genuine expression in mahayana buddhism only though it has been taken from there but it was not uh, <laughs> liberated from the uh, <laughs> negative when it, it was not liberated from the other concepts that were glued to it later on in mahayana buddhism when they found that unless and until we have the concept of happiness the, the people will not be glued to it and this is the reason after the mahayan spread out it has spread all over the world earlier he was the light of asia now he has become the light of the universe Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, you, what Professor Rasmi was you. wishes to say is that in Buddhism, happiness, the concept of happiness, is a later evolution. Well, it, it could be found in sir. idea of bodhisattvahood. So that's sir. the thing that he wishes to say. Well, we have with us Professor Ranjit Ghosh. Well, welcome, sir. Please, your observation, sir. Professor Ranjit Ghosh, sir. Professor Ghosh. Doctor, yes. Welcome, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rao. Um, uh, we could not get enough uh, from uh, Ms. Laila uh, on <laughs> uh, the concept of happiness in mysticism because that was the topic. And so far as mysticism is concerned, and we don't find, uh, we don't uh, use mysticism as a religion. We say Christian mystic, uh, Buddhist mystic and Hindu mystic, all this always associated with some religion. Now, the thing is, uh, when the question of happiness comes, then one question that comes to my mind is this, can there be a concrete experience or explanation of an abstract state of mind? Because happiness is definitely an abstract state of mind. They, these days you find many, uh, they, they are trying to uh, scientifically ascertain the presence of happiness in a person and they are having many um, uh, uh, that uh, determinator how to uh, find out uh, somebody is happy or not. But uh, still the question remains because you see, uh, so far as uh, I was listening to the discussion of Buddhism. Now, these days, uh, the, the Buddhists, they use one technique of mindfulness. And this mindfulness is a 400 billion industry in US and throughout the world. They just want to uh, put you into a framework by which you can, uh, you can concentrate on yourself uh, you can look within as they claim and in the process you will attain happiness. But uh, this type of uh, things, the, the, the uh, way the, in which these modern uh, expressions of happiness, happiness are coming before us, all these uh, are uh, definitely philosophically questionable in nature. Because you see one thing, happiness is something which is associated with our intuition. It is contemplation, intuition, and it is happiness. Uh, and, and the mystic happiness is based on self-surrender. That means you surrender yourself before a deity, or take the case of Gita or any, any religious. Somebody has to surrender himself before the deity and and, and, and in the process, he can attain happiness. But still, one thing, this situation, uh, these this, um, things uh, are just uh, uh, coming to my mind. We have not uh, heard, uh, heard much from 
Miss Lila on these issues because mysticism, uh, happiness in mysticism, and what actually happiness is, and all these things are still to be uh, clarified. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Leila, do you wish to say something? Yes, madam. Yes, please. Yes. Honestly, thank you so much for your comments. I am not, I don't feel disturbed or offended by these comments. I absolutely not. But the question is that, honestly, I, I suggest that happiness in Islamic mysticism, because this is my expertise. My expertise is not Buddhism. I know, I know, I, I studied a lot about Stoics in, in ancient Greece. And, um, but I have not studied other than casual stuff on Buddhism. I just suggested happiness in Islamic mysticism because Islamic mysticism is one of my expertise, particularly Shia expertise. But they told me that this is a small, this is a narrow topic, and we have a broad range of audience. So you must go beyond the Islamic mysticism. Them and you must go go to other mysticism as well. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, you are more familiar with Buddhism because Buddhism is part of your. I mean, you're probably on culture. I'm talking about broad range of culture, right? So, I I'd rather talk about Islamic mysticism and happiness, which was my expertise, and I would would be able to cover it more broadly and more sufficiently. But they told me that this is a small topic. And our audience are not just Muslims, or people are familiar with Islamic stuff, so you have to go to other areas as well. That is why I was not probably able to cover Buddhism. You know what I'm saying? That was the, the reason. I do agree with you, ma'am. You it just uh, tell us, here. one thing you just tell us, where, uh, whether the concept of self-surrender is prominent in Islam as yes, as because, no. because that is the starting point of mystic experience. And if that be the case, why all this? Yes, I wanted to talk about I seven cities. Sorry for interruption. I wanted to talk about seven cities of mysticism, have Shahr Ish, seven cities of mysticism of, of law. Of in Islamic mysticism. The first one actually or the second one is self surrender, right? You and and then we have an self, self annihilation or fana and then we have baqa etc etc. But I thought I should cover other areas as well, other other I mean branches such as Stoics and Buddhism in order to to satisfy the whole audience as well. So of that self surrender is important in mysticism is actually one of the one of the stages or one of the cities are or seven, seven cities of love in Islamic Islam. I am familiar with that. But I just skipped it because I wanted to cover Stoics or Buddhism and find similarities between these three in order to cover the, the topic. That was the reason. No, you are right in that, in that way. Sufi says, I have to say that I have to say सब से तेरे प्यार की मैं गुफ्त गु करता रहूं राज हक की नेमतें पाई है जो तेरे मेरे लिए रात दिन उसकी नुमाइश चार सू करता रहूं एंड फाइनली ही सेज अबाउट द सरेंडर मैं तू बनूं तू तू रहे तुझ में समाऊं इस तरह भूल जाऊं खुद को मैं बस तू ही तू करता रहूं दिस इज द कंप्लीट सरेंडर दैट गिव्स यू द हैप्पीनेस दैट गिव्स यू द पीस फनो जा Stage, yeah. So yes. this is the thing you have rightly observed. Yeah, the thing the the Prof. 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 Professor Rangit Ghosh has rightly said this complete surrender must be there, as in Gita is said, Sarva Dharmana Parikya Jang Mahami Kamsaranam Praja Ahantwan Sar Pape Bhyo Moksha Ishyami Masuja. Don't think what is going to be, what, don't think what is happening all the together. That's why I have quoted Iqbal where he says, अगर हंगामा है शौक से है लाम का खाली खता किसकी है यार अब लाम का तेरा है या मेरा सो दिस इज द स्टेट ऑफ सरेंडरिंग बिफोर द गॉड यू डू नॉट क्वेश्चन हिज माइट यू डू नॉट क्वेश्चन हिज एम्पायर एंड यू विल हैव टू सरेंडर दैट्स व्हाई ही सेज मैं तू बनू तू तू रहे तुझ में समाऊ इस तरह 
भूल जाऊं खुद को मैं बस तू ही तू करता रहूं थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर नाइस डेलीब्रेशन फॉर सेल्फ सर थैंक यू प्रोफेसर सर यू आर इज द लास्ट वन बट वी एक्चुअली हैव सेवन ऑफ देम सेवन सिटीज सेवन सिटीज ऑफ लव व्हिच इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपोर्टेंट आई मीन सेक्शंस इन द मिसिज्म ऑफ खुरासान Khorasan system. So self surrender is actually the last of these seven cities. Yeah, I wanted to to talk about that, but I thought I should talk about a broader range of topics which satisfy my audience, which obviously didn't. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, okay. thank Why you. Why not civilian? Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
and even in some cases we can compare islamic uh, mysticism with vedanta and sometimes with buddhistic uh, monasticism but there are differences as well as there are similarities so this is the first point secondly basically in tasawuf uh, the uh, bliss is considered to be saadat saadat means uh, to get uh, the better of both the worlds because islam does not believe in this worldly or that worldly you know, you know philosophy islam believes that we have to live in this world and we have to live a fuller life but we have to follow a particular way of uh, you know uh, commands uh, which have been given to us by god where we can meet the needs of our body as well as our soul spiritual as well as physical needs are to be met so this is very important a balance between these two since uh, during the time of umayyads there were much luxurious uh, practices which were introduced by the rulers so there was reaction from some you know uh, uh, mystics against uh, this type of luxurious way of life so in this way sufism tried to revolt against that type of uh, this worldliness but it never meant that they wanted to be recluse and leave the world and be in the caves as we find in buddhism so in this way this was just a reaction to the materialism which was being promoted by the rulers and but sufis were living a normal life they used to also have their children and they used to marry also and they used to even sometimes deal with business as we have sheikh abdul qadir jilani and we have many other such type of sufis who were doing business as well but they were just saying that we have to be always just bakar dil bayar that we have to work with our hands but our heart has to be busy with our friend that's allah and then the quran has categorically said allah bi zikr la tatmain al qulub rarely with the remembrance of god is the solace of the hearts basically they were more concerned with the solace of the hearts not of the bodily or the physical pleasures although bodily pleasures are to be met or bodily needs are to be met for keeping our body intact but the purpose of our physical existence is to achieve the spiritual and moral existence and that was the means to that so and was saada saada means bliss and this way and it has been said in the quran la hawlun alayhim wala hum yahzanun the friends of allah or the sufis or the you know valis or those who have no fear and they are not grieved at all because they have understood the purpose of their life why they have been sent to this world and they have to realize that purpose and then they realize it and then they do believe that they will get a second birth in this world but they say that after life there is a life and that is not to come back to this world in order to realize the purpose of your life if you could not do it earlier so in this way their basic concern was with the akhirah that is the life hereafter not this world but they were not shunning the life as the buddhists used to do or go in the caves in this way and third point which i wanted to mention is fana and baqa so in tasawuf there is not only annihilation but there is also to live with god so when you have just killed your ego but then you have to live with god now you are a different personality and that is after fana there is baqa and you have a life which is eternal life and as it can be compared to the view of uh, uh, sri arbindu ghosh that is life divine so you are living with the divine and you have got a life which is beyond these limitations of uh, time and space and in this way this has been mentioned at many times and last point which i would like to make here is that in islamic tasawuf there is a complete you know discussion on uh, the you know saada that is the happiness what we mean by happiness in all respects and they are not just relying on this religion or that religion for this purpose but they are relying mostly on quran and hadith and the life of the prophet and their pious caliphs and other ali especially so in this way we can say that islamic uh, mysticism has a complete code of conduct for getting their you know saada or we may call it as their happiness and we need to discuss that in uh, some other lectures and maybe sometimes uh, leology and myself we can just present a detailed account of what we mean by you know happiness in the sufi context uh, and from islamic point of view from shia point of view from sunni point of view i am really no difference of opinion so far yeah 
so just let me complete first so in this way what madam has said i feel that this was enough for today and she has tried to just uh, at least satisfy the audience because she was knowing the limitations of the audience because people don't know much about islam and islam is most misunderstood religion in the world and it's the south has been also misunderstood rather misinterpreted and if we see the south from the books of the sufis then we can understand what is the actual meaning of saada or the blissfulness or the happiness in islam and it needs more and more detailed account but i think that this can be done only through this forum that is the philosophy family and i am so happy that people are so much interested in these subjects and they are ready to listen and whatever we want to say about the actual you know views about different religions philosophies cultures and then also mystical trends in different traditions so i am very thankful uh, to all of you for your rapt attention and i am also thankful to uh, dr lela as she in this very concise paper has tried to sum up uh, many things which were needed uh, to introduce uh, islamic uh, tasawuf and also what is the concept of you know uh, saada or happiness in it in a comparative perspective although it needs more and more elaborations and details in future thank you very much well uh, dr leila uh, yes. would like to say something yes yes thank you so much for the energy for um, for saving me from annihilation you really saved me thank you I really appreciate it yes Yeah, yeah, Professor Marazi always uh, saved me from <laughs> some danger. No, no that's Baka. that's <laughs> Baka, yes, that's true. I honestly, I just remember something. I said that I am okay with uh, not happiness, but also felicity, which is okay. They, uh, he translated as bliss, but bliss is correct. Absolutely, he is a well-established professor in Islamic studies. but saada is also felicity as well t- translated as felicity i remember when um, my great friend here reached out to me for a lecture which is today which was today i said that mm, let's do it felicity in islamic mysticism saada in mysticism and he but he told me that we have a great bigger audience than muslims mm, and uh, let's do it on happiness in mysticism i remember that so i don't want to bring excuse here no but um, i am not an expert in buddhism although i know something in stoics uh, and i think there are many similarities between stoics way of life and islamic mysticism but um, i wanted to do a lecture on felicity or saada in islamic mysticism but they told me that you cannot do such a thing because our audience are not just muslims or um, i mean educated in islamic stuff so you have to pick up a topic which is happiness in 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 mysticism that is why i went for this and again i apologize for being for delivering a poor lecture if it looks poor to you which obviously did was and i am ready for another lecture for a real lecture on felicity or bliss or saada in islamic mysticism i am ready for that but you must give me some time in order to make myself ready and prepared for that thank you just if i am allowed to say you know your lecture was very complete madam do not feel so although because of the you know you just took less time otherwise you could explain all these concepts in a better way so your success your lecture was successful do not say that it was poor it was very good but you know it needs more elaboration that's the only point <laughs> you have given a nice synoptic view of that and it was very vivid explicit and uh, there are scopes to dive deeper into the, the concept further so it is great wonderful lecture i congratulate you for that thank you Hello. One, one thing i just want to add that uh, Professor Miraji is there. Uh, Professor Sivastam is there. Now, uh, in that context, we can uh, the, keep aside Buddhism, rather Islam and Jainism, who are the believers in the eternal soul. Soul in both uh, uh, religions, uh, two religions, Jainism and Islam. We can talk about uh, the happiness, and uh, not in Buddhism. 
uh, per se because uh, alleviation of suffering is the main theme of Buddhism but uh, happiness is something over and above this. How do you react to this? Uh, can I okay. Well, I want to say something on this. Can I say something? Okay. Uh, Shall I? Dr. Dr. Walmiki, well, welcome, madam. Well, you speak, madam. You speak, you speak. madam. Dr. Yeah, Dr. I think uh, well. what Professor Laila said, uh, comparing with Buddhism, uh, Professor Ranjit, uh, I feel that uh, she was more apt in uh, comparing with Buddhism rather than Jainism because uh, Jainism is quite denial of life, but Buddhism is not denial of life. It is, it is pro life, and at the same time, uh, you know, you can compare the concept of nirvana. This is to Professor Shivastav's comment that uh, uh, in Theravada Buddhism, there is uh, no uh, concept of happiness. I would say that it is how you define happiness. The problem is that our uh, clarity of understanding about happiness is uh, not there. And if uh, we define happiness in another way, um, Professor Laila's uh, contention of, uh, uh, you know, uh, comparing it uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 Buddhism, a Nirvana concept, I, I, I like Islamic concept uh, with uh, Buddhism, uh, uh, especially Sufi mysticism, uh, uh, where it is beautifully said by um, uh, uh, Rumi, she, he says that beyond, uh, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, uh, there is a field. I'll meet you there. And precisely this is what I say that this is very much like Nirvana. This is Nirvana. And Nirvana is, is just by itself. It is, it is not um, to be defined in words. And therefore, the concept of Nirvana is highly mystical. So I, I, uh, uh, I appreciate uh, Professor Laila's contention of comparing these two. Rather than uh, uh, comparing uh, Professor Ranjit with Jainism, it would be more difficult because every moment, every time, it is just going away from happiness because the concept of happiness uh, 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 produces Pudgal and Pudgal being sticky will stick your soul. And that, that uh, is the whole thing of, uh, you know, um, complete, uh, complete detachment of Pudgal uh, from soul. So there it, you cannot compare. But with Buddhism, the concept of Nirvana with Sufis, especially uh, Sufis not of uh, uh, Al-Surhavardi or um, of uh, Ibn Arabi or uh, Ibn Farid, but I would say with Rumi or Shams, you can very much compare. Uh, the concept of nirvana. This is my just uh, very broad because my area is mysticism. Therefore, I would I like to speak about it. But sorry if I I, I, I was not uh, attacking anyone. But I thought that uh, the comparison was apt because I always have felt that nirvana comes very near to Sufi mysticism. Uh, excuse me, Thank madam. You. I would like to say that the Buddhist nirvana is totally different from all these things only because he. At the time of Nirvana, there is no soul and the light is zoomed out, first thing. And secondly, when the same question was asked from by Sanjay Velikthaputta to Buddha himself, Kuti Tathagatu Parmangmarana, what happens after the deliberation of the Buddha? Now, whether he is, he is not, na Huti Tathagatu Parmangmarana, and all these questions were redundant only because he, he, he kept him among that and when he was asked, it means you do not know. Then what did he do? There was a lamp in the evening that was lightning. He just blew it out and said where this light has gone, east or west, south or north, up, up or the down. So these questions are redundant questions, particularly in the terms of the Buddha and Buddhism. But, but I have rightly said that coming to the part of the uh, latter Buddhism, that is the Mahayana Buddhism, now the loving kindness and happiness has started gaining its ground in the Buddhism itself without impairing the basic tenets of the Buddhism. And if you happen to go to the... Sir, precisely, sir, precisely this point... No, no sir, that, that, the, the precisely here I want to say that the Nirvana in Mahayana or in Theravada or uh, Hinayana, it, the concept of Nirvana remains same. 
and when you read uh, uh, the poems of rumi you realize that nirvan is by itself uh, only thing is that it is not been described uh, very literally in the uh, uh, um, uh, you know word to word like happiness but it is it is uh, um, the amount of bliss like sachidanand uh, concept in uh, in shankara's philosophy so uh, uh, this concept is found there is no soul no soul but th- definitely there is consciousness and this yes. consciousness when you are attending nirvan you are not taking rebirth what does it mean if you are happy and this happiness it, is bloom down can translate it and what rumi says dui ka taskara tohid me paya nahi jata jahan meri rasai hai mera saaya nahi jata so that is both a totally different thing here when he says ki main tu banu tu tu rahe tu main samau is tarah what has this is understood in that identity is dissolved in the man god the almighty the allah and there and the concept of nirvana is totally different to each other we cannot compare the theravadic concept of nirvana and the happiness of the uh, uh, mysticism of islam we cannot compare it we need to compare similarity if i am allowed to say something <laughs> yeah it is interesting it is it is very interesting lecture mashallah and discussion also i am happy it means that this lecture has generated some heat and that's great and philosophical debates so my point is basically i think that uh, since we need to understand the concepts whether it is of islam or buddhism or jainism in a different context because when we compare sometimes uh, willy nilly sometimes we create more confusion we have to define as has been said by volcher if you want to discuss with me define your terms so we have to define the terms of islamic mysticism also exactly. for example there is there is fana and there is baqa so in buddhism there is only fana that is annihilation but you no know, i don't say i said there are several things which are very common to both the traditions but first we need to make islamic terms very much understandable which are very clear from all aspects and then only we can compare it with those with other you know traditions otherwise we may not understand the actual subtleties of islamic terminology so far as fana is concerned baqa is concerned mulla rumi is concerned ghazali is concerned ibn arabi is concerned and alhamdulillah we have a very rich tradition in tasawuf and everything has been detailed in such a way that whatever good was found in other traditions they have tried to also imbibe something of that and then they have also presented those in the light of the islamic teachings and ethos so we can't just take them away, away from their original places and give them different meanings because of their little bit influence from here and there so in this way we need to understand those terms on their own you know uh, account rather than just because of the comparison we may just make compare you know uh, some you know compromises here and there so in this way whatever uh, professor valmiki says he is also right we can do this uh, compare and what uh, professor avinash has said that's also rightness and then what professor gosh has said so we need to first we make islamic tasawuf and its various terminology very clear and detail the account of that is to be given then only we can compare that with other traditions rather than making a you know haste uh, comparison or uh, showing that these are similar so that will just create some confusions about islamic tasawuf thank you, and i need that it needs more appreciation thank you thank you thank you thank you professor um, marazi well every system every uh, belief has its own dynamics well we cannot strictly compare we cannot uh, put both of them together when there are differences well we have with us damodar pramod sir welcome sir we will we will like to listen back i i have related a question because uh, of professor hamid because fana of uh, islamic fana and the buddhist fana is totally different thing because there the fana is for someone दूर साहिब से तू एक नजर देख रहे तेरे बीमार का दम निकलता रहे इट इज द फना ऑफ द इस्लामिक अंदर मिस्टिसिज्म ऑफ इस्लाम बट ऑन द कॉन्ट्ररी सच सॉर्ट ऑफ फना इज नॉट देयर इन बुद्धिज्म वी आर नॉट ऑफरिंग अवर लाइफ फॉर अदर्स सो वी आर इट इज नॉट फना इट इज a uh, blooming out of the consciousness and what the karmic with that was lit, that is uh, giving power to the cons- stream of consciousness that is withdrawn so that's why so, we need to do, uh, define the terms that's very good <laughs> thank you
Okay, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, uh, Professor Srivastava. Well, the dynamics differ. Well, we cannot strictly uh, bring uh, both of them together. Uh, well, in the strict sense, uh, a strict parallel cannot be drawn. So, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Hamid and Professor uh, Srivastava. Well, we have with us uh, Dr. Pramod. Sir, yes. uh, please, uh, your observations and comments. Yeah, um, I'm happy to hear the topic. Uh, generated by Laila and other excellent topic. In fact, we can say in a different angles, happiness is a very complicated topic and abstract topic. How to define happiness is the most complicated. It all depends upon the how you feel it actually. I will say that we must be happiness. We must be fortunate that we are born as human beings. That's the first happiness. There are 84 lakhs of species are there in the universe. Everybody wants to come to the human form. Then they go to the liberation. First, we're fortunate, we're happy that we're born in the human form. That's the first thing. Once if we come to this one, how to go to them? Our main purpose of life is to reach the God. We are the part and parcel of this um, uh, Supreme Lord. Once if we go to the home, once if we meet the father and mother, will be happiness. That's the main happiness. And, and as you know that there are three worlds. One is a spiritual world, material world, internal world. Spiritual world always be happiness. It's very difficult to go. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, out of millions, one, one person may come to the spiritual world. But all people are trying to go to the spiritual world. Now, we are born in the materialistic world and out of the 84 lakh species we have taken a birth, the platform is given us to go to the, to go to the Lord. But we are entangled with our three modes of nature. One is the mode of passion, mode of goodness and mode of ignorance. And we are controlled by so many total parameters we have in our body. They are coupling you. They are attacking you how to do it actually. Once you, if you control your senses, you will be happiness. Then we have the happiness comes from the internal world actually. If you see comparing everything with the material world, material world will never be happiness. You read Bhagavad Gita, you wrote good temple, something will happen, something about diet is well decorated. Somebody has given something information that decorated. When you talk about spiritual equity, then happiness. When your soul and super soul and frequency match, then will be happiness. The material words, the sorrows and happiness are temporary here, material words. You may be, I get a job, I get awards in the temporary, after they'll come back sorrows. Your main job is, main purpose of life is to go to the, uh, to meet with the spiritual uh, supreme lord. We are fortunate as I said that, and the the you the all religions and all religions religions the same thing actually and love each other love each other and serve each other actually then gives the happiness only and the present life what we are facing is because of bad karmas what karmas we have done it we have a lot of information with the literature scripture books they have mentioned it and what are happiness we are facing because of bad karmas what you have done it and so many temples, so many religious places we have it. We are going to the temples and everything to decree to eliminate our the eliminate the bad karmas. The bad karmas eliminated, they will be happiness at all. It's a very, very complicated topic, and we have to do as much as we can. We never get happiness unless we reach home, we go on working days. Then and as I said, the three worlds we have it, internal world, supreme world, and uh, in, uh, material world. Material, material world always gives the unhappiness. One who controls the senses, senses are most enemies for us. They always want one thing, something, 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 how to control them. When the person who controls the senses will be most happiness. These are my observations, sir, and uh, the talks are very good, actually. It has enlightened me in all the things. I will, I did not, I'm a man of physics. I will try to enlight, uh, convert into a metaphysic point of view. Whatever I know it, I just explain to you. Thank you, first, uh, Professor, give me my time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Pramod. Well, uh, Dr. Brown? From, yes, sir, Pro Professor. Wait, am I audible now? Am I audible? Back, we are coming back to you in a minute, sir. We are coming back to you in a minute. Well, a good take from Dr. Pramod is that uh, we should be happy that we are born as human beings. Yes, that's the first thing. This is the first, first point. And um, the good thing in it is that it is in this form as a human being that we have the access to the physical, mental and spiritual. And it is in this form that we have an access to what is called liberation or reaching the highest. So, so happy for all these. So this, this is the thing that we get from Dr. Pramod. Well, well uh, Dr. Srinivasan, well. Yes. Yes, Srinivasan. Uh, you have set the ball rolling in 
very nicely about uh, Dr. Srinivasan, sir, please go ahead, sir. His link is not functioning well. Hello. Am I not audible? Oh, now audible, sir. Audible. Okay. Audible. Okay, Professor Laila, I think. He, he has written uh, his question in message box. Sir, please read out. I think I have uh, written there. I would request, I mean, ask Mr. Uh, Professor Rao to read it and then. Uh, Dr. Rao, please go through the yes, message box. Yes, I'm going to. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, um, Professor Srinivasan um, uh, wishes to know, um, um, uh, 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 understand what is happiness through the hedonistic philosophy. Um, what is this? Pleasure is the highest good and ultimate goal of happiness in life. Sir, I don't see any specific questions, sir. Well, uh, what Professor uh, uh, Srinivasan wishes to say is, well, um, he is uh, pleasure-seeking or... Um, okay, and now I will tell. See, uh, Professor Laila Ji. He is pleasure-seeking happiness. State can be attained through hedonist feeling also. Then Connection is unstable, and that's why he is not the audible mode. Okay, now let me close it. Thank you. Okay. So, what I could understand uh, from the message box is um, whether hedonism as a philosophy or a way of life can it define happiness? Okay, this is uh, probably the question that uh, Srinivasan uh, Krishnamurti sir wishes to ask. Well, um, uh, well, I think um, much has been discussed on that, but uh, one thing um, uh, that comes to my mind, well, um, well, Dr. Amita Valmiki and others even uh, spoke on this, well, happiness in itself uh, is so abstract, uh, and even uh, Amidullah sir uh, even spoke on that, that happiness itself is so abstract a concept so you need to define um, what exactly is happiness. Well, even definition is not at all possible. Okay, and this is uh, on one hand we are having a problem. On the other hand, mystical experience. So this again is a problematic assertion. Okay, it's again we say we cannot uh, associate mystical experience as definitely a religious experience. A person not adhering to any religion can also undergo this special kind of experience called the mystical experience. So we cannot uh, 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 really associate, there is no need I say, well we may associate but there is no need to associate any sort of religion with the idea of mysticism. So even this mystical experience, what we say again has a quality of ineffability, it cannot be experienced, it cannot be communicated, whatever, what is the experience is. So taking in that sense, there is a problem in defining happiness. There is a problem in uh, um, uh, expression in mystical experience. So the idea, the very idea of happiness, if at all, that is involved in a state of experience called mystical experience, that we can never know unless and until we undergo that experience. So whatever happiness that we talk of, discuss, that is uh, just um, our understanding, the way we look at it. But exactly what exactly that state of happiness, okay, remains still indefinable it can never be understood okay even we don't know what exactly is mystical experience because no mystics no mystic can come out to say that this is the experience that he has because it even the words fall sort of that so there lies a lot of problem in this so uh, well um, hello well, hello know, well, uh, Dr. Rao, Dr. Rao, I want to add yes. just one thing that is, if uh, yes, what 
Pramod, Professor Pramod uh, say that uh, as human beings, if we consider ourselves as an embodiment of Ananda, then there is uh, happiness is well inbuilt in us. But we just don't realize this. And that is why Sankara, Sankaracharya's Mohamud Garam, uh, the, 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 which, which says, Chidananda Rupa Sivaham Sivaham, that is the thing. We are all embodiment of happiness, Ananda. And that Ananda is the, uh, is, is the real uh, uh, rendering of what happiness in Oshkan terminologies are. Thank you. Sir, happiness is a mundane concept. First thing, what has to be differentiated between Ananda and uh, I, I want to say the happiness. Happiness is purely mundane concept. And in Gita, while uh, Pramodji was telling, there is a one verse it is said, this is the state of happiness. So this is the happiness which is not, it has end. And Ananda is a different thing which is permanent. And we are talking about the happiness not of Ananda. This is the basic difference between Ananda and the happiness. Happiness is a pure secular concept. Happiness is pure uh, mundane concept. And when we go to the mysticism, it transcends the mundane areas, but it doesn't go to the Ananda. We, Yoki, that's why it is said he, in that stage, it cannot be defined what it is and what it is not. So neither it can be compared with Jainism and Buddhism, nor it can be compared with Gita. Gita, huh. someone has told about the hedonistic approach. What Charvak has said, Ranan Kritva Gartam Pavit, Yavad Jivit Sukham Jivit, Bhatme Bhut Asya Jehasya, Unar Agman Asuta. This is a pure mundane things. We like, we like the pleasure and pleasure cannot be the happiness. Happiness is a different concept which has been defined in the mystics uh, appearance of the Islam, uh, 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 Sufis and it is a very nice concept. And there, it is a state where one, uh, Professor Hamiz has said, Pana, and uh, just I am forgetting the word. So these things are there. It is not a Nirvana. Baka, baka, baka. <laughs> baka means yeah. to live, and Pana means to get annihilated. <laughs> No, no, but, uh, but, but the thing is, in all these concepts, transcendence is there. We cannot deny transcendence. That is the thing. And, and, and in transcendence, uh, the, well, uh, it is a debatable thing whether Ananda is happiness or happiness is Ananda. Uh, uh, that is a debatable one. But transcendence must be there. Thank you. Sir, one, thing, one thing, sir. This happiness is a momentary effect. It cannot be a permanent effect. Movement reflects what the sense is. It is a mundane thing. It is a secular um, expression. Yes. <laughs> basically, basically, yeah, yeah, excuse me, sir. Basically, the, in the Islamic Tasov, there are three, you know, types of souls. One is the, you know, soul which always leads us to immorality. And second is the pricking soul. And third is the satisfied soul. So these are the stages of human self. Uh, from you know commanding to their satisfied soul as soul as soul is so is it well, excuse me first so basically we have to understand the soul in the stages one stage is when our you know uh, desires are very much strong then we control them our you know desires and then whenever we do something wrong and we are being just pricked or we are being admonished and then third stage comes when our soul becomes stronger and then it has the you know a living it abides with god in that tranquility in that peace and then there is no fear on such people in quran as it has been said thank you that is the different space mashallah you have a very good you know uh, command on urdu poetry <laughs> mashallah uh, i would like to add one thing sir the happiness, as I said, the temporary momentary affects itself. But one thing I realized that the soul, whenever you do the work which, which matches with the soul, it will be happiness. In the early morning, the Satya period, Satkuna, Satvik period, if we hear some songs and everything, the religious or a spiritual song, happiness will come. Something will touch your heart. 
that you are a soul, it gives happiness actually. That's the main reason. Even Prabhupada, he says that it's a Dukkhalayam. You can never be happiness in this world, materialistic world. It's a temporary. And so many things are going on. It does not mean that you're a man, your intellectual person does not mean kill somebody else. Okay? If you kill somebody else and animals and everything, and that will bad effect will take place. A lot of people are taking the birth and the birth and birth and death going on because a lot of karmas will do bad things. The person who does happiness with that satisfy their soul definitely will be happy. You may not feel it, but slowly it goes there. Slowly it goes there. It all depends upon the soul. The matches with the soul activities will be happiness. That's what I would like to say, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramod. Well, uh, I would like to uh, look into what uh, Dr. Ghosh has said, very nicely has said. Whatever the system it may be, everything depends on transcendence. Whenever yes. we restrict ourselves to the mind, we are not, um, te, 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 we are not um, te, meditating, we are not in the mystical fold. So we need to transcend the mind itself. We have to go beyond. The very beyond. beyond. Control the senses. Controlling the senses. The mind. No, not, not just controlling, even we have to go beyond the mind to yes. touch the soul. So as long as you are with the mind, you are always disturbed. You cannot, even though you feel you are controlling, you have to go beyond. So there is, I think, I think there, like, there lies the mystical experience. And yes. that's why no mind can come into play to describe what a mystical experience is. Yes. So much lies in transcending the very mind itself. So mystical experience is the transcendence and what is the transcendence? The transcendence of the mind itself. That's why a mystic never comes back to say what sort of experience he had. So very nice take that we can have from Ranjit Ghosh says that this is the much, much of it lies in transcendence and transcending the very mind itself. Thank you sir, I may be wrong but this is the understanding no. that I from Dr. Ghosh. Gita says that one should go to Sutta Sattvik, Sutta Sattvik. Not only Sattvik, you have to go upon the Sutta Sattvik. When you go to Sutta Sattvik, you will be more happiness. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramod, for your views, ideas. Well, uh, it was a very good discussion on the uh, on the issue. Well, uh, um, we should have listened to Dr. Um, Srivasta, sorry, Dr. Srinivasan, sir, but due to some network issue, we are not able to listen to him. Uh, sorry for that. Well, uh, we have with us uh, our admin, Professor Pramut Madhas. Well, I wish to uh, invite him for his uh, observations and comments. Welcome, sir. <coughs> Dr. Pramod, please, please mute. Please mute. Thank you. I really appreciate. Uh, the talk of Dr. Lella Madam, and I agree with her. When we are having a, a debate, a discussion, we should be happy with what the speaker says, not with what she does not say. What the speaker does not say, that is a very vast area. But what she said, we should, we should focus on that. What the speaker did not say, then the entire volume of philosophy will come out. That means, that is, I think that is happiness. We should be happy even a speaker speaks uh, two minutes or five minutes, what she said, I am telling what she really said. She said four things, irrespective of religions. As a human being, we should be grateful. Can any religion will deny this to be happy one should be grateful. Grateful to what? Grateful to human being, grateful to nature, grateful to any gratefulness is a sign of happiness. I think it is accepted by all religions. Second thing is, she said that uh, uh, contentment, santosa, that one should should have the sense of contentment. 
sense of satisfaction. Whatever I have, I should be satisfied. I must be satisfied. And being satisfied is a, is a, a very is the sense of her gratefulness. Because everything, because I have come naked to this world, I did not have any luggage with me when I took birth in this earth. So whatever I have, it is given by the Lord. So I must be satisfied. That is the sign of happiness. Can any religion will deny this? Third religion said that we should surrender before God. Or we should live with God. In her language, she said, we should live with her God. With God means with a higher soul. Our soul or our self is empirically conditioned. So we should live with a higher level of consciousness. That is God. That is Allah. That is uh, Jesus Christ. That is, that is named differently by different religions. Can any religion will deny this? Is it not a sign of happiness? And fourthly, uh, she said, I forgot, the very beautifully she said, the, the fourth point. Okay. Um, so, the topic was the happiness in mysticism. Happiness itself is a mystic experience. Very nicely it is said by Dr. Rao and uh, Dr. Amita Valmik and also Dr. Lela Madam is the speaker, she has told that. She has not used the word mysticism though that was the topic. But her, her uh, deliberation indicates that, that the happiness itself is a mystic experience. We have different types of experience. William James uh, has written a very beautiful book, Varieties of Experiences. We human beings have scientific experience, we have religious experience, we have a mystic experience, religious experience and a mystic experience, there is a difference. When we are attached to a particular religion with its rites and rituals, with its doctrines, then we are bound by that condition. Mysticism is beyond that. So happiness itself is a mystic experience. What is that mystic experience? Here I agree with the Dr. Ghosh. That is a that is a, that is a, that is a world of a transcendentality that cannot be translated in the language of logic, in the form of arguments, in the scientific method, um, scientific experiment experiment in laboratory. We cannot verify that. We cannot testify that. It is very personal, and it is not a, it is not everybody's cup of tea. We all pretend to be happy. Rather, we should use the word pleasure. We are pleased. We are not really happy. The moment we are discussing about happiness, we are not happy. When we are advising anybody to be happy, we are not happy. Happiness is very personal. So when all these things are fulfilled, when one has an attitude of uh, gratitude, when one has the sense of contentment, and when one surrenders, one has the ability to surrender. Surrender to God is a very big thing. Even surrender to your father, surrender to a good man, that is also enough have a sense of surrender. All these things will lead to that mystic experience which transcends the scientific and mundane experience. We cannot speak of discuss or discuss about the mystic experience through other categories of experience. Debate is all right. We are debating. We are arguing. That's all right. And then the comparison to Buddhism, when it was uh, there was a discussion about Buddhism. Buddha said, uh, "Sarvam dukkha," that uh, life is full of suffering. 
that suffering means unhappiness. Suffering, what, how can we feel suffering? How can we define suffering? Suffering, mean, suffering means unhappiness. And the second noble truth says that there is a cause, at least we should understand, if there is anything, it is backed by a cause. If there is pleasure, it is backed by a cause. If there is pain, that, that, that is also backed by a cause. Pratitya Samadpada. At least there is a cause. That means it is, it is not dogma. It is not dogmatically accepted that life is full of suffering. Life is full of unhappiness. It has its own cause. And what is that cause? The cause is kamana. The cause is ignorance. Ignorance is the cause of bondage or suffering and expectation, unnecessary desires are the cause of suffering. Then there are, suffering can be eradicated. This is a very optimistic note of Buddhism. Suffering can be eradicated. That means unhappiness can be eradicated. And lastly, that eradication of suffering is possible through Nirvana. Indirectly we are speaking eradication of un uh, unhappiness Directly we are not speaking happiness. This is the difference. I am not unhappy and I am happy, same thing. So in Buddhism, everything is spoken in a negative way, but that indicates the positive meaning. Nirvana is also de defined, not only the extinction of our desires, but also it is a state of a bliss. So when we are defining happiness, we, we, ha we all have our own connotations. Sometimes we define happiness with, um, with pleasure, hedonism. Sometimes we define happiness with bliss, blissfulness. Therefore, Dr. Leila described three phases of happiness. So we can fit different other words into these categories. When we are speaking about um, physical happiness, we can speak about pleasure, we can speak about mundane the happiness that comes from this mundane experience. Then when he sees, speaks about pure happiness, so that terminology we can use in the sense of a blissfulness or in the um, exactly that may not be ananda, the state of ananda, because in ananda state, the experience here is not there. That is Satchitananda. That is Brahma state. But before that, the very beautifully happiness can be experienced mystically in this empirical world. So here there is a union between empiricality and transcendentality. That means we can live in this empirical world but with a mind of a tranquility, with a mind of a peaceful peace, with a mind of a, with a sense of a happiness. For happiness, we need not go to Himalaya. For happiness, we did not go to um, 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 to become Brahma. Because when we become Brahma state, we can't analyze, we can't discuss anything. So the life is full of suffering. It is admitted, but in that world of suffering, we have to be happy. That is called the yoga. That is called the uh, art of living. How can I become happy? How can I have that mystic experience along with other types of experience? Because, because my goal is to be happy. I very unfortunately, we all have the common experience. People have everything. People have everything, still they are not happy. And they are con on the contrary, people have nothing, but they are happy. That means the object is not the cause of happiness. If the object can make you happy, then that object can make you double unhappy. So happiness is not concerned with any object, this object or that object favorable object or unfavorable object, 
failure or success. Very beautifully in the Bhagavad Gita it is said, you go beyond the pairs of opposites. Go beyond, because both the pairs are illusions. This pair is justified by logic, this, this dialectical side is justified by logic, and that dialectical side is also justified by logic. Now you are satisfied with object X, next moment that object X make you unhappy. So, so don't confine your happiness with any object at all. He may be your father, that may be your profession, that may be your name and fame, that may be anything. If your happiness is object oriented, then it is not really mystic experience, it is not really happiness. When your happiness is subject oriented, then, then that becomes personal, that becomes mystical. Mystical means when the experience is purely subjective, without any objectification, without any objective, objective uh, conditioning. If there is an objective condition, then it is scientific. We need a scientific explanation. We need a logical explanation. When it is purely subjective, it becomes personal. I can't communicate my mystic experience to anybody else. It is not through any religion. It is not through anything else. It is beyond all religions. So, um, I am sorry that I forgot the uh, fourth point and that was very interesting. Uh, but this talk was very wonderful. Discussion was also very um, insightful. Um, but uh, I think uh, we should focus on what is said. Uh, because in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, short uh, time, uh, we, we should, what is not said, that is a vast ocean of uh, knowledge. So therefore, um, um, the Professor Maharaj said, that uh, next moment we can have uh, elaborate uh, discussion about this topic. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. This is my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Professor. Thank you for your insight, for, for invitation, and for this nice comment. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Professor Das, for your nice observations. When well, you tried to uh, bring out a synopsis of, a, uh, of the talk of Dr. Leila, well, uh, well, 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 not uh, a very good discussion that followed her lecture. Well, it um, took the attention of a um, um, good number of scholars to reflect on what uh, uh, Dr. Leila has uh, said, and, uh, and 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 this discussion really um, um, brought in a lot of things to reflect on well we cannot uh, define any sort of finality whatever has been discussed because happiness is such a concept uh, which is so abstract well we cannot uh, in two sense define it because uh, any attempt to define what is happiness again is uh, is something something can be mistaken well uh, well i see a comment by um, professor um, um, hamid uh, uh, um, um, hamidullah sir again uh, that brings um, again um, a bit of uh, disturbance in my mind when he says happiness is more physical than spiritual then again um, uh, we go back to um, the lower level of uh, happiness what Dr. Laila has talked of. Well, Professor Maraji has talked of uh, different levels of happiness and uh, well um, I see a problem again. So, so very idea of, well uh, Dr. Al uh, Valmiki, well we we'll, we'll would like to listen to you. Well, Dr. Valmiki. Um. Uh, uh, sir, uh, it was just by chance that I kept it, uh, my microphone open, but I would uh, still feel, that I still feel uh, prof what Professor Das uh, uh, concluded in his remarks that uh, uh, this is uh, where, you know, um, you have empirical, no doubt about it, but it, it, the intention is transcendentality. And when you are in transcendental level, uh, maybe Islamic mysticism, Buddhism, or whatever it may be, uh, happiness, uh, might, I was just uh, writing down in the chat box, we need to, uh, uh, you know, we need uh, hermeneutics uh, here very much. We need to interpret the concepts. How do you interpret? So, hermeneutics intended 
it is very much required that uh, we define happiness i agree with uh, professor uh, shrivastava very much but i still feel that when you go above uh, empirical that is vyavharik uh, and you know shankara does talk about jeevan mukti now what is that you are in vyavharika world happiness is there but it is transcendentally you are uh, you you know you you transcend that level to parmarthi being in uh, in empirical level so this is my contention that there is lot of sim- in fact there is not only similarity between buddhism or islamic mysticism i feel there is lot of similarity between all the religions in the concept of bliss blended with happiness this is what i wanted to say well thank you dr valmiki well happiness has no religion okay so it is for all and we are human beings well uh, well what uh, dr leela even said happiness is the goal of uh, every human being well it was a nice lecture and the discussion well dr leela what could say something thank you yeah i just want to thank everybody particularly dr marazi for his clarification and for the dr thomas for his invitation and the feedback at the end and dr amita i agree with her that we still can compare religion from the perspective of their um, mystical aspect or mystical dimension and it has been done actually but it is not that wide wide spread in academia but it has been done by some scholars um although i didn't have access to them at the moment when i was preparing my lectures but i still believe that although we believe that islam has has for for us has a special place but we, i still believe that we can compare religions from the perspective of their mystic, mystical experiences or the teachings and i think they are all they want to teach us all of them some the same thing that um i mean that they experience i mean the, the the very personal experience of uh, unveiling the deity or unveiling um, i mean closeness to deity is all, all of them are the same more or less no matter islam is the last religion khatmal i mean the the khatmal i mean religions or no matter buddhism um, cannot be categorized under the rubric of abrahamic religions but they can we can compare them thank you so much thank you uh, thank you dr leila for uh, for your uh, lecture and um, and also thank uh, all the uh, participants uh, uh, for the <coughs> valuable comments well um, professor pramod sir well we should uh, end up well uh, roma vani madam is there well uh, last line um, sir madam would you like to say something vani oh, madam Good evening. It would be very unfair if I say anything on the topic, because I missed uh, Dr. Leela's talk. But I followed the discussions and the beautiful, comprehensive picture that uh, Professor Dash uh, drew for me. You know, um, um, the way I am uh, very simple philosophy that we are ourselves happiness at a state of happiness at a state of peace which i always say like a very calm lake and as j krishnamurthy said that it is only when we have desires that make us lose our happiness in trying to you know run after those desires or make those our goals and um, uh, because today's topic uh, dr leela dealt with happiness in mysticism i tend to agree that mysticism itself is happiness and happiness being in happiness itself is in mysticism and uh, hope dr leela i'll be able to catch your talk on youtube once the link is given to us and thank you very much for the beautiful discussion and drawing us towards happiness and mysticism thank you good evening thank you uh, thank you uh, uh, roman madam well uh, it was a uh, uh, a nice talk why i say nice because uh, uh, because it has, it has attracted a lot of discussion a talk which is not followed by say uh, uh, a beautiful uh, question and answer session i don't think it's a beautiful lecture because anything that is said by the speaker if 
it draws the attention of the participants and they get in, uh, themselves involved in a serious discussion then it speaks of the speaker that the lecture was good and it has created that wave to discuss on so i should thank uh, uh, apart from uh, thanking dr leela i should thank all the participants who made this evening so beautiful and good and uh, for their valuable comments so uh, uh, i should also thank uh, our uh, um, admin uh, professor das uh, who made valuable remarks towards the end and um, and then to initiate the talk uh, professor srivastav and uh, uh, dr ranjit goes as usual they raised uh, beautiful questions uh, to initiate the discussion and today too they have been uh, so active in uh, um, giving their view points to carry forward the discussion and uh, professor hamidullah um, uh, he he came to um, uh, he came to the picture at various points to uh, clarify certain ideas uh, uh, especially with reference to islam because he is uh, an expert in that field and overall uh, even amita valmiki tried to uh, draw a parallel even towards the end roma madam and uh, certain questions in the chat box uh, by um, sravani madam and uh, uh, um, krishna murthy sir uh, really that has uh, given a lot of um, um, a lot of lot of food to think on okay so i think overall this um, evening was uh, very beautiful academically beautiful academically enriching and uh, personally i feel um, I, i i live uh, well uh, with lot of um, uh, contentment and uh, sense of happiness that um, i say that um, this lecture is successful and the discussion that follows that uh, is still more successful so with these words i thank everybody uh, for participating in this um, lecture and being connected with the lecture academically seriously and i doubly thank for being so seriously connected with this lecture thank you everybody over to professor das so also thank professor das for uh, initiating this program this initiating this very idea and uh, for all arrangements for making this webinar successful over to professor das for his uh, for 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 close down of this webinar over to professor das. thank you everybody yes we shall close uh, but i shall speak only one line for dr lella madam um she is very focused very focused and she is very pertinent she is very clear she does not speak more um whatever she says she spoke only for 15 or 15 minutes perhaps but uh, that was very thought provoking it was it was so thought provoking that uh, she is so intelligent also uh, that the discussion uh, went for more than 90 minutes so that is the structure of a lecture that is good i really appreciate we philosophy family is grateful to the speaker and Uh, i appreciate all the um, senior professors uh, present here for their um, valuable um, remarks comments observations and criticisms too thank you all um, all the participants are also great speakers they know how to speak they know how to arrange question so thank you all So, Dr. Lella, Madam, you please select your next topic. Um, we shall invite you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, this meeting is declared closed. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Of course. Thank you. <laughs>